All right, guys, my message title today is a question. Can we slow down Christ's coming or Christ's return? And I know that that kind of sounds like a funny question, but it's because a strange thing has been happening in this day and age. There are some people, as a matter of fact, there are many people who have become openly obsessed with slowing down the return of Christ. Now, for those of you who that is a foreign idea to, I just want you to open your eyes for a little bit and just think about all of the people that you know. There are people who are literally freaking out right now, thinking that we're coming to the end of days, thinking that we're coming into a close proximity to the tribulation, and they are absolutely terrified. They're absolutely horrified. Some of them are, are even talking about, wait a minute, I haven't gotten married yet. Oh, I haven't I haven't opened my business yet. I, I haven't really lived life yet. And and they're they're actually hoping that even though they're in their 30s or their 20s or their teenager or even a preteen, they're actually hoping that Christ delays his return until they've had a chance to live life more. Uh, they want to have a kid first. They, they, they want to have a family first. Uh, maybe they want to have grandkids first. Let me tell you something, guys. That's an example of people that they don't realize it, but they love life and they love the world in, in an unhealthy manner. Uh, and so we're gonna be talking about that today. Uh, even from a political uh, perspective, many Trump supporters, I I'm, I'm standing here in America right now, but when I'm in the Philippines, it seems like I talk with Filipinos more about politics than I do Americans. The whole world uh, watches American politics for, for some reason, okay? And so many Trump supporters actually believe that by having Donald Trump being elected, that has somehow slowed down the timeline of Christ's return, okay? Or maybe they would say it another way. Maybe they would say that has slowed down the timeline of the Antichrist's appearance, okay? Uh, and these people are overly political, all right? I want you guys to know uh, that I have seen so many commentaries uh, online, on television, on YouTube, places like that, about people who really imply this uh, in what they're saying. And, and they're even using this as, as bait to get you to, to support Donald Trump for a second term. Now, I'm nonpartisan, and, and I do believe that he would do a good job uh, on a second term. How However, uh, I am not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Trump supporter, I'm a God supporter. And the only way that I'm going to put my vote there is if I believe that that's what God wants me to do, okay? Uh, so I would encourage all of you guys to become a little less political, okay? And be much more centered on the kingdom of God and what advances the kingdom of God, okay? So there's a lot of people that, that they're saying, hey, if you'll vote for Donald Trump again, seemingly it's gonna slow down uh, the emergence of the Antichrist. It's gonna slow down the timeline until the tribulation comes. Now, some of them uh, do speak from a pretty good perspective in that they want more time to save more people. Okay, and that's okay. I, I understand that, uh, but I'm I'm just wondering. Okay, is this even biblical, and is it even right thinking to think that you can slow down somehow the return of Christ? And we're going to get into that right now. What does the Bible say about? the timing of Jesus's second coming. Let, let's get into that because that's where we're going to find our answer. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, it says, no man knows the hour or the day, or the day or the hour, depending on which, which version you look at. No man knows the hour or the day. Now, this is interesting because we know that Jesus was fully God and fully man when he was here on the earth, okay? And, and it's interesting because Jesus even says in this scripture that he doesn't know the hour or the day, okay? That's a very, very interesting statement by Jesus saying, I, I don't even know. The angels don't even know. The only person who knows when it's going to happen is Father God, all right? Now, uh, I, I'm just questioning this, okay? How can it be that Jesus doesn't know since he and the Father are one? 
one. Uh, since, since God is the three in one, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And guys, my short answer on this, but, but we can talk more about it if, if you want to contact me, is that the Father is the one who operates in foreknowledge. Okay, uh, Jesus obviously would have the power to do that if he chose to do that. But as a man, Jesus literally surrendered himself to the will of God. And it was the will of God that no man knows the day or the hour, including Jesus. Okay, and so God knows because he has foreknowledge. Uh, and, and I want to put this into our perspective from our human understanding. Okay, and from our side of time, because God knows what's going to happen in the future on the other side of time. Uh, okay, the day of the Lord's coming, and this might be shocking to some of you, may not actually be determined yet. Okay, all right, it may not actually be determined yet. Now, I've put this word in there, may because it is a debatable issue, okay? Some of you are scratching your heads right now and you're wondering what in the world I'm talking about. Stick with me and you're going to, to, to really be interested in the uh, remainder of this teaching. So I've asked this question, wait, we can speed up Christ's return? Okay, uh, because that, that, that's what we come to uh, with the, the implication that the time is not yet set. Okay, we can speed up Christ's return. Now, now I've, I was telling you a lot of people have an attitude that they want to slow down Christ's return, but that's not actually in the Bible. Nobody in the Bible ever tried to slow down Christ's return. Nobody in the Bible ever even discussed the possibility of slowing down the return of Christ. Okay, but there is this scripture in the Bible it's 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. And it says this, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, and I've put in parentheses here, the day of the Lord. It's talking about the day of the Lord. What does it mean things are going to be dissolved? This, this earth is going to be dissolved, okay, with fire, okay? Uh, everything is going to be dissolved. Everything is going to be destroyed, okay? Since all these things are thus to be dissolved on the day of the Lord, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, okay? Basically what Peter is doing right now is, is he's saying, hey, listen guys, Jesus is coming soon. Now he was speaking this more than 2000 years ago, okay? But 2000 years ago is soon. It's not very long. And, and, and that's, that's like a snap in time. But, but where we are right now is so much closer, okay? So much closer to the return of Christ. It's unbelievable. Guys, if you've been following this, this 5G technology, I, I was listening to a business leader uh, a couple of days ago, and, and he was, he's someone who's involved in, in 5G technology being implemented worldwide. OK, and he was saying it's going to be about five to seven years until the entire world has 5G. OK, now that is significant, guys, because uh, most of us believe that when the people who are going to receive it, I'm not going to be one of those. But when people receive the mark of the beast, it's going to be some sort of an implant that, that allows you to buy and sell. It's going to have your passport in there. It's going to have your vaccination records in there. Uh, it's going to have certificates in there. It's going to have your driver's license in there. It's going to have your banking information in there. It's going to need to run on technology, wireless technology that is way better than what we have right now. I shouldn't even use the word better. I should use the term faster because we all know, okay, uh, that that technology is something that causes cancer, okay? Uh, and the Bible even says that those people who take the mark of the beast, they are going to receive and develop malignant sores. I believe that they are tumors, okay? And so that technology is literally going to make people sick. Probably people are going to die from having technology inside of them that runs off of the the 5G network, okay? So guys, five to seven years. Uh, the Bible says that the, the Antichrist is going to be given rulership over the entire world. It actually uses that term every tribe and nation, 
okay? Uh, and so, you know, every little obscure little little uh, town, every obscure little little country is going to be under the rule of the Antichrist. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be worldwide. We are so close, guys, okay? But he's saying, since this is going to happen, you ought to be thinking about what kind of people you should be. You ought to be living lives of holiness and godliness. Now, I believe that he said that for two reasons. Number one, so that you will be ready because no man knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. We don't know if, if Christ is coming before the great tribulation. We don't know if Christ is coming during the great tribulation. We don't know if he's coming after the great tribulation. We don't know these things. And if people think that they're so smart that they've got it figured out where they, where they hold the one doctrine really tightly, I got news for you. You might be wrong. You might be right. It doesn't matter. We all need to live prepared. Amen. And so he's saying we ought to live in holiness and godliness so that we will be ready, but we also need to live lives of holiness and godliness so that we will be bringing forth the harvest. Guys, I don't know anybody that successfully does the work of God unless they're living a godly life, unless they're living a holy life. If you're not living a godly life, if you're not living a holy life, you are not focused on the work of the kingdom of God. If you are not awaiting the return of Christ, then you are not doing your job as a Christian, which is to reach the lost and bring in the harvest. But we go on to, to verse 12, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. And, and he goes on, and after he says, you got to be living a godly, got to be living a holy life, you got to be waiting for, and here it is, hastening the coming of the day of God. I've underlined this for you guys. What does it mean to hasten something? It means to speed it up. Uh, you know, we used to use this word in the English language a lot more than we do now. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're telling someone to go make a delivery and you're afraid that they're not going to go very fast or they, they might grab a coffee or a lunch on the way and, and, and you're wanting them to not stop, you're wanting to make sure that they're urgent about it, you would say, make haste. Go quickly. Don't stop. Hasten your journey. Leave now. Okay. Uh, it really means to make something go more quickly. And Peter said, waiting for the day of the Lord, meaning you're waiting on him. You're ready for him and hastening, speeding up the coming of the day of God. What does that imply, guys? That implies that if we will get our job done more quickly, Jesus will come more quickly. That's the implication there. Now, there's some debate on that. I'm going to get into that, okay? Now, he goes on and he finishes his thought. He says, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. He's emphasizing again that, that this is the end of all things, okay, uh, here on earth, and it's the beginning of eternity for those of us who, who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with Christ, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. That's not human bodies. That's heavenly bodies. It's not the bodies of the angels. It's the bodies of the firmament, okay? All right, all of those things are going to melt. They're all going to burn. Now, some do not agree, and they vehemently don't agree. There's people that are really, really anti uh, the, the way that I just presented this thought to you, okay? Uh, it's interesting that even several of the translations of the Bible, even ones that are considered good, even ones that are considered solid, have left some of this out, okay? Uh, some of what? Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Okay, they've left some of it out. And, and the part that they have left out is the hastening part. They don't want that word in there, okay? And, and so, you know, you have to go to the Greek. And what you find out in the Greek is that the word in the Greek really does mean to hasten, okay? It actually literally means to make haste, to urge on, okay? Almost like, like someone's running a race and, and you're, you're on the sidelines, you're saying, go faster, go faster, come on, you can do it, you can win. Move, move, you can, you can cross the finish line faster than the way that you're going now, okay? Uh, to urge on and to come down, 
Okay, well, what do we want Jesus to do? We want him to come down, okay? We want him to return to earth and find faith here on this earth, okay? It is accurate. It, it comes down, guys, to the use of the verb for hasten. Uh, if we had some scholars, if we had some theologians here right now uh, that, that were going to argue with us, they would argue with us based on the usage of the Greek word that we get uh, the English word hasten from, okay? And I'm not gonna go into this too deeply, but, but I'm just gonna give you a starting point so you guys can kind of figure this out on your own. Uh, guys, if hastening, is a transitive verb. It means that we can, through our actions, make the coming of the Lord happen faster, okay? Uh, now, that is what I believe, okay? But if it is a different kind of verb, like I said, you guys Google this on your own, you guys study this on your own. If it's a different kind of verb, then, you know, those people that are against the idea of us being able to speed up the return of the Lord, uh, they, would, they would be able to make their case uh, that that's wrong usage of that verb, and they would literally leave it out of their translations of the Bible, okay? Uh, I do not agree on that, but I, before we get too far, I've put into parentheses here, guys, that this is not a salvation issue, okay? In other words, this is a debatable issue. If you want to believe that God has already set the return of Christ in stone, and it cannot be changed, okay, uh, that's fine. You can believe that. But if you want to believe, as I believe, uh, that we can speed up the return of Christ, then you can believe that too, okay? And that is the way that I would encourage you to believe, because it seems to me like the Bible is encouraging that kind of mindset, that kind of attitude. Here's another thing, guys. Uh, obviously, if we speed up the return of Christ, God already knows it. He literally does know the exact day, okay? Even if we do our job and speed up Christ's return, he has foreknowledge. He can see on the other side of time. Do you get me? Okay, so in a sense, he knows, okay, no matter what we do. But in another sense, we have a job to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the correct attitude. All right, guys. Now, there are other scriptures that imply that we are involved in the timing of Christ's return, okay? Uh, that, that word imply means gives us the idea, even though it may not say it exactly. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 is one of these scriptures, and it says, and they sang a new song. This is all the people who end up spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And this is the key right here. I've underlined this for you. From every tribe and language, and people, and nation, okay? What does every mean? It means every. It means that, that there's going to be a representative from literally every language that has ever been spoken on earth in heaven. Somebody is going to make it from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation, okay? It's going to be an awesome thing. Heaven is very diverse, okay? Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So, so what is the implication there, guys? The implication is there can be no unreached people groups. For Christ to return, there can be no unreached people groups. Now, uh, we know that every prophecy that has, has had to be come to pass and, and be fulfilled uh, in order for Christ's return has already happened. It's, it's just a matter of a few final little details, okay? But one of the things that, that, that we don't believe has happened yet, okay, uh, is that 
there are still unreached people groups. And so when you send missionaries, when you support missionaries who are going into all the world, preaching the gospel to all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all tongues, you are speeding the return of Jesus Christ. And that's why we do it, guys. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're looking at my shirt right now. I, I've, I've worn this shirt for video a couple of times. I love this shirt. This, this shirt gives a, a current statistic statistic that this shirt with a cross on it is currently illegal in 53 countries, okay? Uh, they, these are the countries that we are sending missionaries into. I, I received a report from a missionary friend of mine the other day uh, that their underground Bible school uh, in another country uh, that I'm not gonna mention, it got exposed and, and they had to literally shut it down uh, and they had to literally move to another part of the country uh, and reopen again in secret. And, and even a couple of their Bible college students uh, were tortured with electricity. Okay, uh, this kind of thing is happening all the time. We need to keep supporting missionaries who are out there reaching every tribe and every nation. Guys, this is current. This is like last week. Okay, uh, this is this is real stuff. All right, guys. But I want you guys to know it's really difficult to calculate how many unreached people groups there are. Okay, uh, current calculations are there, there are something around over 16,000 people groups in the world. And of that, there's about six, it could be as high as seven, but uh, around 6,000 people groups that are still unreached. What does that mean? 40% of the world is still unreached. That's current statistics. Those are very credible statistics. It's difficult to calculate, but the way that I read the Word of God is that at least one person from each language is reached, okay? So only God knows how many people have been reached. It is our job to reach them, not just one, but as many of them as we can. We want to save as many people as we can. But just track with me for a second, guys. Let's say that there's an unreached people group in, in some mountainous region, you know, that's very hard to reach, and no missionary has ever been there. The gospel has never been preached, so they don't know the name of Jesus, but one of the, the villagers in that mountain region, they came down from the mountain, they traveled to the city, okay? And in the city, they lived in the slums until they worked their way up, and now they have a job. They're from an unreached people group, but we don't know that they're from an unreached people group. They receive Christ in a city. All right, what that means is that that people group will already have one person in heaven okay, that is going to be proclaiming, worthy are you, Jesus, to open the scroll. And so, and so God would not have to wait for anyone to reach that mountainous region because one person from that village came to the city and they accepted Christ, okay? So in other words, guys, this number 6,000, it might just be 600 or it might be 3,000 or, or it might be 2,000. We might be able to get this thing done within two years. We might be able to get it done within five years. We might be able to get it done within six months. Only God really knows when this thing is going to come to pass. Are, are you guys with me on that? Okay, I, I can't hear you, but, but I believe that you just said yes, okay? All right, here's one more scripture, guys, that implies this concept, and it's Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And it says this, and this gospel of the kingdom, this is Jesus speaking, will be proclaimed. Some versions say preached, okay? This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Jesus was saying until this gospel is proclaimed to what? all nations, all tribes, all people groups, all languages, okay? Just as what was implied in Revelation, okay? Until that happens, the end will not come, okay? But the end will come when this gospel is proclaimed throughout the whole world. That is a powerful statement from Jesus Christ. Now, now what is he telling us to do? Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? That's what Jesus is telling us to do. Now, in light 
of the previous scriptures that we have read, it is obvious to me that at least one person from every, uh, from every language will make it to heaven. The whole world, okay? And guys, by the way, uh, if, if they have internet, they can hear the gospel right now watching this, okay? If they have internet, they can hear the gospel anytime. If they have radio, they can hear the gospel anytime. There are radio stations that are ministries that all they do is project shortwave radio to unreached people groups. All right, guys, there are people groups that will never have a missionary reach them, but they will be fulfilled. They will be reached in the eyes of God because the gospel will have been preached to them. All right. But again, some scholars don't agree. They don't want to believe this, okay? And uh, this right here that I'm going to give you is a common argument. They say that Jesus was referring, uh, at the time that he spoke these words, 2,000 years ago, they say that he was referring to the known whole world at that time. All right? Uh, what was the whole known world at that time? Mostly the Roman Empire, okay? Okay. And they use this next scripture that I'm going to show you right here from the Apostle Paul to try and prove their point. They want to believe that Jesus was, was referring uh, to, to a very limited part of the world at that time, okay? So this is the, the verse that I'm talking about. This is the one that the skeptics try to use. And it is Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, okay? And the Apostle Paul says, which has come to you? What? The message of the gospel. As indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Okay. Basically because of the apostle Paul's terminology here, they're trying to prove that Paul was saying it's already been preached. It's already been preached in the whole world. Well, I don't believe that, that that's what Paul was saying. He was being very specific. He was saying, wherever this gospel is being preached in the whole known world right now, okay, but God knows uh, how many people groups there are going to be eventually, okay? Uh, God knows that the entire world is going to be populated, even though they didn't really understand it at that time, okay? Uh, he's saying, wherever it's preached, it prospers. Wherever it's, pre it's preached, it is fruitful. So that is why I do not buy into the idea, okay, that the whole world was already reached during the Apostle Paul's time, and so Jesus can come based on that, okay? Uh, I don't buy into it, but many people do. And again, this is not a salvation issue, but this is an issue which will temper you. It will determine how eager you are or not eager you are to get the job of the kingdom of God done. We need to work, guys, while it is still day. Guys, we should want to speed up or to hasten Christ's return. It is the right attitude, okay? Guys, I don't know for sure, okay, if we can really speed it up. You know, I'm not a, a, a heavy-duty scholar, okay? Uh, I, I do my best, okay? But I believe it is the right attitude to believe that you can speed up Christ's return, and it is the right mindset, and it is the right way to live your life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where this is Paul talking to Timothy, his spiritual son. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Okay, in other words, there's waiting for me in heaven a crown of righteousness because you don't get to heaven without righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to another group of people. It's very specific. All who have loved his appearing. Okay, I love that word loved. Okay, what does that mean? You're not one of these people that's trying to slow down the return of Christ. You're one of these people that, that you really want to see Christ return faster because you love him. You love eternity more than this temporal life. You love the kingdom of God more than you love this world and the things in this world. All right. You are loving the idea of his appearing. And you literally, you cannot wait when all of the wars and rumors of wars and tremors and 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 all of the diseases and and viruses strike you literally have this reaction 
Yes, Jesus, you're returning soon. I can't wait to see you. This life is nothing. I've been on mission for you. My, the, the rest of my life is going to be a mission for you, but I am loving your appearing. Uh, another version, uh, this is the NLT, I've been using the ESV. It says, all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Both are correct. We love his appearing and we eagerly look forward to his appearing. The Apostle Paul is saying, okay, saved people want Christ to return. Saved people are anticipating the return of Christ. Saved people love Jesus so much that the faster he returns, the more excited they are. And so that's why when all of these things happen around us, they lift up their heads to the sky. They look up to the sky. They lift their hands to the sky and they say, yes, Lord, even so, come more quickly. And we look at these signs and we are not afraid. We look at these signs and we get excited because Christ is coming back soon. Here's my final thought on this message today, guys. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking these questions and I'm giving the answers. So can you slow down Christ's return? No, absolutely not. You cannot and you shouldn't even try to. Should you want to slow down his return? No, absolutely not. That's not a godly mindset. That's not a godly attitude. You need to long for his appearing, amen? Guys, if you're listening to me and, and, and you find yourself uh, that, that you've had the wrong attitude, guys, this is an opportunity to get right with the Lord, amen? All right, okay, the next question is this. Can you speed it up, Christ's return? And I've said this, probably. All right. Like I said, we don't know that for sure. Okay. I believe it. Others don't, but it's the right attitude to try to speed it up. Should you try to speed it up is my final question. And the answer is definitely you should try to speed up Christ's return because that is what the Bible says to do. Wait for him in holiness and godliness and hasten his return. How do we do it? through missions, through reaching unreached people groups, by doing the, the, the ministry uh, that empowers the gospel to go forth into all the world and reach every tribe, every nation, every language group, every people. God bless you guys. I, I'm so excited uh, about this message and I'm so excited uh, that, that you guys are, are with me on this. Uh, like I've said before, feel free to contact me privately. Uh, most people like to contact me privately. Uh, you know, they're shy for some reason. Go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, at my email address or, or through Facebook chat or whatever. Okay. Uh, I would be happy to discuss these things with you. And guys, uh, I just want to invite you right now to lift your hands wherever you are to the Lord just, just right now. Lift your hands to the Lord, and, and if you need to close your eyes to focus, I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the words of Peter, and I thank you for the words of Paul, and I thank you for the words of Jesus, Lord, that point us in the right direction of having the right attitude, even during this time of crisis. I pray, Father, that, that your word, which is like a, a piercing sword, Lord, a double-edged sword, I thank you that it has penetrated every attitude that is against your word. And Father, I pray for those who have literally been scared or terrified, or, or, or they, they, have, they have literally been one of those that has been hoping that you won't return so quickly. Father, I pray over them right now in Jesus' name, that you would break every spirit of fear. You would break every spirit that, that hinders intimacy with you. You would break, Lord, every amount of love for the world that is greater than their love for you. Lord, you have said it so clearly in your word that those who love the world and the things in this world 
have enmity with God. They are enemies of God. And Lord, I don't want that for anybody within the sound of my voice. Father, we reject the world. We reject the spirit of the world. Lord, we reject materialism and we reject, Lord, a spirit of pleasure, Lord. Father, we reject confusion and we reject, Lord, the news and and, and all of the, the mindsets and all of the brainwashing that comes from the dark side, Lord, from the dark forces that reign and rule in this life. Father, I speak life into my friends. And Father, I do pray for us. Lord, we as a church, Gateway Mission Assembly, we are going to send 40 missionaries to unreached people groups. We are going to plant more churches. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that our people and the people who have not even joined us yet that are going to be joining us, I pray, Father, that they would be quickened in their understanding, that they would be quickened, Lord, on their mission. I pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you would prosper us, Lord, Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of pesos, Lord, will come in. You will prosper your people once again. This is just a test. We will pass the test. We will do the right thing next time. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that the, that, that the wealth transfer that you talk about in your word, it will come to pass, Lord. You will prosper prosper supernaturally all those who love your appearing, who long for your appearing, who love the kingdom of God, who want to sow in righteousness. Father, I also pray for those uh, who who are uh, sick, Lord, whether it's from the coronavirus or from any other thing. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I speak healing into every life, into every mind, into every body. Uh, the Lord just spoke to me that there's somebody that 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 actually you you have something going on uh, with with illness in your body that that it's not really an illness; it's something in your mind. Uh, they call it psychosomatic, and and you know every time you go to the doctor, it's like the illness changes to a different thing or. A different different part of your body. I bind that right now in the name of Jesus. Let your mind, let your mind be healed right now in Jesus' mighty name. Fear you bow down to the Spirit of God right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I just pray for uh, against cancer. I pray against HIV. I pray, Lord, against pneumonia. I pray against the flu. I pray, Lord, against blood disease. I pray against anything going on in joints and muscles in Jesus name heal everybody from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet all for your glory in Jesus name and father uh, during this time uh, it's it's interesting how many uh, fights are going on among family members that they're not used to spending so much time together uh, even even in China I saw a report that the, the divorce rate went up during the virus uh, and and it's because husbands and wives are just not used to each other and so father I pray for a grace I pray for your power to come into every household Lord that husbands and wives will have their love rekindled Lord that that, that the families would come together in a new and a powerful way. I pray, Lord, that you would make, Lord, your word and worship of you, Lord, uh, to be the altar of every home and that there would not be any other focus in the homes. Father, I pray for a desire for clean and wholesome entertainment. I pray for a desire, Lord, to reconnect uh, with our siblings and those others who live in our homes with us. Father, we love you. We appreciate you. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And everybody says, amen. God bless you guys. Uh, I'll be broadcasting again sometime during the week. Uh, definitely, I will see you again next Sunday.